Yeah. So let's start to talk about this book. Today's our topic is chapter four and chapter five. So first it talks about most programming languages exhibit a phase distinction between the static and dynamic piece of processing. Static is parsing and type tracking, dynamic is execution. Even though lately there are some weird cases like dependent type is one, but also even just C++ const expert or what Dick is doing, it's kind of defy this model. We're, we basically run arbitrary coding like in static phase. So the static is also def is also related to the type safety. If our the type system is not properly defined, we we have an unsafe so called unsafe language, which we will talk about in chapter six or seven, I think. Notice this unsafe here is very specifically type safety. It's not, for example, it's very different from what rough folks when they talk about safety. They usually talk about memory safety, not type safety, even though it's highly related, but still different. Uh, yeah. In the chapter, we present a static of the simple expression language E. So everything is expression. The language just have one sort, which is expression. And it is basically a calculator, but it also adds some stream processing. So we have two kind of two different types and then we can have some kind of type checking. So there is a chat for what this language support. We have two types, number and string. And then just everything is expression. And we have variables, literals, past times, concatenate, length, and let. So I guess that is the only complicated thing when we introduce a new variable. Then we just say we, our type system is kind of a constraint under, under, under context. So we, we need to, we uh, in our, the static of E, we need to define, we need to def define what, what this E is tau means under a certain, under a certain typing environment, typing context. This just means X is a set of variables. Remember the chapter three stuff. Uh, and then everything is pretty straightforward. Like if we add, we already know X is tall in the typing environment, then X is tall. This notation means we have a uh, we have a uh, just initial environment and then we add this rule to it. I guess this is not rule, this is like add this binding to it. And the type of string is a string, type of number is a number, type of plus is plus if both of its, if both of its, uh, just arguments is number. Similar for times, similar for cat, except it's string, similar for length. And 
the only little bit more complicated stuff is here. When we say if E1 is tau one, and if if we know that that we, if we have the appropriate condition that x is tau one, then e two is tau two. So I guess this is. This is get a little bit more complicated, and that's why that's why we need this kind of notation here because because this judgment itself is conditioned, and then this judgment then be used as a condition for this whole thing. So. We basically need to know the even type even is well typed, and then under the assumption even is well typed, we know the type of e two. Then, then we know the type of the whole left basically. Any question for this one? Okay. And we can just use induction to say. For every typing context and expression, there there exists at most one type for an expression. An expression cannot have like non-deterministic type. Inversion for type. This typing. This is interesting. This is basically type inference. So we have uh, like four expressions: e one plus e two. Then we can immediately know that. If it is well typed, then the type will be a number, and even it choose that number. As for this very simple language, this is pretty trivial. For more complicated languages, for example, language with ad hoc polymorphism, then we basically just can't see those kind of things anymore. It will be more complicated. We have like those kind of rules like weakening. This is this is the same as we talked about in chapter three when we talk about generic hypothetical judgment. So it basically means if if a, okay. Not clear how the not clear how the in how induction is applied to lemma four point two. So yeah, later later if you have questions, you can just shout out. You don't interrupt me. You don't need to use the comment, but it's okay. Uh, let's see. So we need to induct on this. If E is plus E1, E2, then tau is number. I think like the induction hypothesis would just be like, you you assume it for e1 and e2 and then you want to prove it for e being plus e1 e2 yeah i think the hypothesis is just this one and and then we can immediately see we don't need to consider those cases because it's not uh, in the right form. Uh, wait, sorry.
Yeah, this is, sorry. Yeah, I, I feel like I am a bit confused myself now. So like, I mean, so you have a, you assume you have a well-defined type for E1 and E2, right? Yeah. And then plus E1, E2 has a type. That would be yeah. the, the assumption. Well, the only rule that gives plus E1, E2 a, is a type is the rule that says it's a num. The only way to derive plus E1, E2 having a type is that 4.1D. Yeah, I just feel like this is not induction, but it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like a it's it's not the normal type of induction on like terms or whatever what whatever it's called. It's just like a one step thing, kind of for each separate rule. Yeah, it's like a direct proof, but well, I guess we do need to look through all the rules. So I guess we can see we induct um this. We need to look through all those rules, see oh, only there is one case where we have plus. Yeah, yeah. It is it's not the usual type of induction you would one would think of, that's for sure. Yeah. I could be talk, talking out my hat, but I seem to recall at the end of the last chapter he was maybe doing something like this where it seemed to be like the reverse of induction. Like starting with a conclusion and working backwards or something. I could be definitely be wrong. That's let's try to find one. Probably not. Otherwise, it would not take that much time. Universe. Oh, is this search? No, it's already in chapter four. I don't know. Maybe there is something we missed or we just forget. Yeah, I, I will check later. And next time, next time we will talk about this. Let, let me quickly take a note on my phone. Yeah, we talked about weakening. Substitute is is all still the same as we talked before. Decomposition. For every type tall such that P is tall, we have no, I guess we did, it's just the substitution part we can decompose it to first. First, we need to know this. We need to know E is well typed. And then with this additional rule, we need to know this. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like you could and, replace a, a, an expression with a variable of the same type, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, 
Then the it's then it says the construct of a language class classified in one of the two forms, the introduction and the illumination. So introduction forms for type determines the value or canonical forms of that type, which in our case, it's very obvious we just have string and number. We don't have more complicated stuff yet. And for the elimination case, determine how to manipulate the values of a type to form a computation of another type. So it's all the other rules are in elimination. Like those ones. So it will be clear when we talk about chapter five dynamic stuff. So, so what do you consider the let uh, rule then? He doesn't say it or there. He doesn't specify it there. Yeah, I think it's elimination. Okay. It's still like, we are, we are trying to like break down that into simple stuff. And then it's some kind of note about the static in the sense considered here was introduced by standard ML, which as far as I'm aware, the author worked on it. So it makes sense. And there are some other stuff. Uh, and then it's chapter five dynamics. So for the static part is basically type tracking. We know the type of the program and we track for certain properties. Then the dynamic part of language describe how the programs are executed. So the book described a bunch of different kind of dynamics. There are structural dynamics, which is the most often used, like a small step with really different transition system that have a step-by-step -step process of execution. Then there are contextual dynamic and the equational dynamic. We, we can talk about them later. And for, first, the book talk about transition system. This is kind of very similar to like, finite automaton kind of stuff that we just have a bunch of states. We have initial states and final states and we have transitions. And a state that is not a final state and it cannot have, it don't have transition to another state is stuck. So when we talk about type, system, uh, type safety later, we don't, don't ever want a program to stuck. Mm. 
that mean, just means it's not type safe. But we will talk about the form definition later in the next chapter. And also a transition system is deterministic if every state there exists at most one state as prime that we can transition into, otherwise it's non-deterministic. Uh, non-deterministic, for example, threading, definitely not deterministic. Uh, another example, for example, how, how C specifies the argument evaluation order of functions is not deterministic, even though the actual implementations will usually choose a deterministic order. And the transition sequence is just a sequence of states that we go with. Uh, transition. And also there's this idea of iteration, which is inductively defined as S is like just can it reach directly to S. And if S, S can transist to S prime and S prime can it reach into S double prime and S it reach into S double prime. Which I, I don't really understand what's going on here. And the book later didn't use this much. Well, I guess it's a similar idea, just like step, one step, just like transition and. Yeah, it's guess... a pretty common thing. People take the reflexive transitive closure of their operator, of their, um, you know, that transition system. Yeah. You do it in language, formal language theory a lot. Not sure why he needs it, but. And also we can have this kind of end step transition, I guess, end step iteration, I guess it's, it's defined this iteration because we want to get into here. This by itself is just not that useful. It's the same as transition, basically. Okay, so let's first talk about structure. Uh, I, I have a question here. Like he talk, he talks about a property being true for a transition. What what does it mean? Property holds for that transition, like P of S of S. Like what would be a good example of a property that is true for a transition. Uh, sorry, where? Yeah, it's here, for example. I guess like one thing could be maybe like that it's maximal, like what he just defined previously, like maximal or being complete. Okay. Oh, I get it. Okay. I'm sure there's more interesting stuff, but that's something that comes to mind. Yeah. I guess later, later we will have more interesting stuff. Uh, structural dynamic, then there's a simple case. Just we need to know something's value because if something's value, we don't need to continue to step through its final state. 
Uh, and for the transition between states, we have rules like those. These are pretty intuitive. Even though it's kind of like they just take this plus for granted. It's this plus come from somewhere. And there are a lot of boilerplate rules like this. Just says what they yeah, they call search transitions. Just says yeah, we have this expression we need to evaluate its left hand side first and if left hand side is a value, then we evaluate the right hand side. And then when the both sides are numbers, we, we can do this. Notice it doesn't say what, what to do if the, like say this is a, M is a string. Because it, the dynamic only specify well typed program. It doesn't, it won't say anything for other programs basically. Uh, so I, I have a question about like for 5.4 C, is the reason why E1 val is an assumption so that it's always like a well-defined transition? Because I guess like an alternative, an, another rule, hypothetical rule would just be E1 and E2 goes to E2 prime, and then you get the same like conclusion. But this is saying you can only do that if E1 is already uh, uh, Yeah, so this, evaluated. this means it's deterministic. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, if it's, for example, if it's, this is C, then we can get rid of this part. We just have, we just have two rules competing with each other and it's okay. But this language is deterministic. So we will always evaluate the left-hand side first. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And similarly for cat, similarly for multiply, I guess you don't even bother to show. Uh, yeah, for and for lat. So this lat, it's the book says it's the by value interpretation of lat and omitted the by name interpretation. So, because first we kind of evaluate E1, when E1 is a value, then we substitute E2. This is, if it's, so by value is basically means it's eager and by name means it's lazy. So if it is by name, then which means, we will not have this rule and this rule will directly do substitution. And the book further comments that the by value interpretation save work if it is used more, more than once, but with work if it is not used at all. Which is basically the trade off between eagerness and laziness. So, so when it's by value, so you have to first evaluate the E1 yeah. in, in order to substitute, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, by value means we need to just go through this rule. We just. <laughs> Repeatedly go through this rule until E1 is a value, then we until E1 is okay, I understand. And yeah. then you can do the substitution. In the
And the terror, terror vision sequence, this is, this is like a uh, terror vision tree we saw before, but just we do this, do this kind of steps instead where we do one transition per step until we get a final value. And then we it's talking about the principle of root induction we introduced in the chapter two, which means to show any property hold for a hold for a transition. It is enough to show that the property is closed under our rule. Uh, is closed on the of all of our rules. So we need to do reinduction uh, for all of our rules, basically to show any of the property. And the property can be, for example, is deterministic. This will be a property we need to show. And also there are some other property of our E language like nullity of values. So for no, no expression of E, do we have both E val and then E can transist to some other state. And we can just do reinduction basically Basically, we just have those two states to check, basically. And those two states don't have any rules to transist into other, so that's it. And also our rule is deterministic, which means if we have those two transitions from E, then those two are alpha equivalent. There are no way if we have an expression E that can transist into some different states. And it's a similarly, we can use induction to show that. And then we talk about the inversion principle of the language design. states that the elimination forms are inverse of the introduction forms of the language. But I'm not 100% sure what this paragraph is talking about. Any ideas? No idea. Yeah, I guess we can skip that. When we talk about type safety, those kind of stuff, I guess it will be clear. So there Sorry, is a very- isn't, isn't it just re coming back to the thing from the previous chapter with like Loma 4.2? It's just the other side of. Yeah, 
the same thing basically means that when you evaluate you kind of traverse the typing backwards yeah yeah something like yeah that. makes sense makes sense all right that's why it's good to have other people because if it's me i would just struggle and i just don't understand what's going on uh, then there is contextual dynamic which is the same like kind of isomorphic to the structural dynamic The main idea is to isolate instruction step as a special form of judgment of the instruction transition. And to formalize the process of locating the next instruction using a device called evaluation context. So this is basically, we have explicit instruction transitions here. Eval is not changed because we can't do anything with values. And for the instruction transitions themselves, it's also about the same as the previous ones. Except like previous, we have a lot of certain rules. And now here we only have we only have rules that actually perform computation. And this special judgment is used to specify the next instruction to be executed. So we, we can write like that. We say, I don't know what this symbol, how to pronounce this symbol, but <laughs> We see this judgment, if this judgment and then we know we know to first evaluate the left-hand side of plus. It's, I think it's just E. Does E I think it's math cal E basically? Okay. Neutral and spoken latte. It's mascal. Okay, I get. I, I I'm pretty sure, but not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't use it uh, enough to see. So the the first one, the five point six a. Okay, it's just saying that a whole is this evaluation context, and then E1 being an evaluation context means it has a hole in it somewhere. Is, is that what it's saying? Yeah. It's, it's still not clear. Why do you put an evaluation context inside a plus? So it's got to be an expression, right? So it's an expression is a new, here is, I don't get it. So I'm sorry, what do you mean? I mean, how do you add an, let's say, let's just look at the plus with E cal one and E two, right? Like, how do you add an expression to an evaluation context? 
or oh so equal one is an expression actually and the whole equal yeah, one is e x okay yeah it just says determines the location of the next instruction it does not say it's it is an instruction it says the location is in there Oh, okay. So, for example, in 5.6b, so if I know where to evaluate inside of E1, right, if I know the instruction value in the plus E1 and E2, that means I have to go inside E1 and evaluate in the this determines the evaluation context pretty much, right? Yeah. I, I still don't get that, the 5.6a, the whole, whole thing. And there are those rules, which is even a little bit weirder. It's basically thing, if you have no premises, then you're just gonna go and do the evaluation of the expression. You have no choice, right? Yeah. The contextual dynamic for E is defined by a single rule. If E is the result of this, even transistor even prime, E prime is the result of this and yeah, makes sense, I guess. <laughs> and then there's just a theory to prove that the structure, the structural semantics and the contextual ones uh, are the same. Structural dynamics, sorry. And for the equational dynamics this one this one is like a very very different it's the it's like specify how to compute like it's not computation steps but instead it is this kind of relationship like first say like E is equivalent to E if E is well typed. And then say if E is equivalent to E prime, then E is equivalent to E prime. Those are this, this rule is, uh, I guess it's just to state the equivalence is Commutative and this is associative. Right. Are you associative word, right? Transitive. Um, yeah, yeah transitive. That's just the property of the properties of uh, an, an equality. Yeah. yeah. It's not equality. That's why no, they use a, a different It's an equality like thing. Yeah, it's not equality. Because yeah, those two those two e can be totally different, but then they need to evaluate into the same thing. Basically, that's what they are talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Similarly, similarly, we say if e one is equivalent to e one prime and e two is equivalent to e two prime, we have we have this relationship. And this let rule is a little bit interesting that they will talk about 
later And then for use, using this kind of rules, we can just we algebra for our program to get this lattice at the end equivalent to 10. And then it talks about like we cannot from the above rule to derive to derive this because indeed in our plus side we we see nothing about the relationship between E1 and E2. That's a surprising. Even though like we know it is true, but not from this definition, basically. Yeah, and the end it says for the expression language E, the relationship of equivalence holds if and only if there exists a value such that we can you have our E and E prime can evaluate into this value? I guess when I say evaluate here, because in later chapters we we're actually talking about evaluation. So here it just means step, 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 step until we get a value, which is different from evaluation because it's different way of specified dynamics, but the results should be the same. So why is it that we can't derive 511? Is it because of the infinities? Because he says we can't do 511, but we can do 512. And 512 is, we can do it for any particular number. Yeah, 512, we can do it. 512, it's just, well, we plug in some numbers, that's it. But so we can't end up with an inclusion that has the turnstile on the bottom. Sorry, what? You can't what? derive the general rule. Like you can't, you yeah. can't prove the general judgment that x one x two num yeah. derives x plus one. You can derive in particular you know, for any numbers. You can derive the equivalence, but you can't derive the rule. So if so that confuses me, um, is this because we're not accepting some some parts of of math where you'd say, I guess I can't find a counterexample. Because I know there is there are no counterexample. I guess right. it's just like that's what they're talking about is just different kind of way to specify semantics are good at proof different things. For example, so from these game one, rules, you can't get that. You can't get that. Right. Yeah. And if you don't, you don't allow proof by contradiction. No, you have to, you have to be constructive, which he gets to later on in the book. 
Yeah. Well, well it's, it's only it's only applying these particular rules. Like, so it has to be these constructive. Particular rules, you can never end up with a, a you know, a, a conclusion, a final line that has the form of five eleven. You can only end up with final lines that have, or you you can you can end up with other form other final lines with, you know, that are de de derived judgments, but the specific case of commutativity, you can't. Because we're, we're yeah. constructing everything from these rules. Yeah, okay. that's right. So it's just limited to these rules. Got it. Yeah, I think we're done here. We can stop recording.